Okay, hey everybody, it's Andrew Hubbard here, and today I'm jumping on to talk to you all about GDPR. So I'm sure by now that uh, anybody who's running a small business and is online has heard about GDPR. I know that I've had questions from a lot of you about GDPR and particularly the impact that it has in terms of running Facebook ads for your business or in terms of running Facebook ads for your clients. So today I've got something pretty special for everybody. I'm here talking with uh, Suzanne Dibble. Now Suzanne is a multi award winning business lawyer in the UK. She's an absolute wealth of knowledge when it comes to GDPR. Um, so Suzanne's worked with a lot of big companies all around the world, but in particular, she's worked with Richard Branson's Virgin Group to help them with their data protection, uh, data protection and privacy, uh, as well as running one of the largest, if not, I think the largest uh, and most active Facebook groups focused on GDPR. So that group is GDPR for online entrepreneurs. Uh, and then in brackets, it's got UK, US, Canada, and AU. So you'll see that if you search for it. Uh, you can also just go to andrewhubbard.co forward slash GDPR group, and that will direct you straight to Suzanne's group on Facebook. And if you want to learn more about Suzanne, you can find her at suzannedibble.com as well. So Suzanne, great to be chatting with you and welcome. Thanks for having me. Delighted to be reaching new international audiences. I'm actually quite uh, surprised in a way that, that international audiences, particularly the US, are actually taking notice of GDPR. I think initially the reaction was, oh, what's this European legislation got to do with us? But now I've seen definitely over the past few weeks that international businesses that have an audience in the EU are really starting to take notice of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I've noticed that with my own audience and, and students. Um, it's kind of been barely mentioned. And then over the last three or four weeks, particularly the US cohort have really started coming out and saying, look, we're running Facebook ads. What do we need to do to, to get up to scratch on this? And, um, and I'm sure you've seen this as well. There is, there are so many different sources of information out there. Many of them, uh, let's just say aren't entirely uh, accurate. And <laughs> oh yes. I mean, this is the whole reason that I set up my Facebook group. I was merrily consulting with multinationals on it. I mean, my, my audience actually is, is very much the small business and online, particularly online business community. Mm -hmm. um, but because, uh, you know, the, the, um, I, I do basically data protection lawyers at the moment are very hard to come by. So I was consulting with, with multinationals. And, um, and actually what prompted me to set up the Facebook group uh, was the fact that there was so much misinformation out there. Um, and you tend to find, particularly the marketers, are very prone to make blanket, they don't really understand the law and then they're very prone to make blanket statements about what you can and can't do. So I really set up the group in, in response to my frustration in, in seeing this misinformation being uh, carried about and the confusion that that was causing. And uh, so yeah, so I set it up on the 28th of February, I think, and in two and a half months, we've grown to just under 30,000 people in there. And it is a hugely active group. Um, and I'm, I'm, as a lawyer, you know, I'm delighted that people are actually interested in an area of law because it doesn't happen very often, you know. So, um, so yeah, but, but yeah, you're right. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And I'm just here really to bring the sensible, balanced approach because what there also is, as well as the misinformation, is there is a lot of scaremongering going on with the headline fines of 20 million euros or 4% of your global turnover. I worked out that if Facebook were to be fined the maximum amount for the Cambridge Analytica scandal, they'd be facing a fine of $109 billion based on their 2017 turnover. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 this, this legislation has got a lot of teeth. Um, but saying that, you know, I've got very small businesses in my group, like one man bands who are thinking if they're not 100% compliant on the 25th of May, they're going to get fined 20 million. Now, of course, that is absolutely not the case. Um, but I think the, the, the level of the, the increased sanctions, the fact that can, customers can now take you to court as well, as, as opposed to the, it just being the regulatory authorities, this, this increased um, regulatory environment and also the potential for people suing you means that people are taking it a lot more seriously. Um, but in reality, you know, if, if you just follow a few simple steps, you're going to be okay as a small business owner, as an online business owner. Um, what you can't do is stick your head in the sand and ignore it. Uh, that would not be a winning strategy. Uh, but, you know, goodness, the panic levels have risen to all time highs because they've realized there's a week and a bit to go until it comes into force. Some of them only, have only just heard about GDPR, you know, it's not like the UK government and the EU government has been 
writing to small businesses and saying, this is the law that's coming into force. Here's what you need to do. They're just finding out about it through networking groups or, you know, talking to people or their online forums. So, um, so that's the first thing to say is, you know, if you're new to this, don't panic. The fact that you aren't a hundred percent compliant by the 25th of May when it comes into force, you know, it's a large guillotine is not going to fall from the sky and you know, you're going to be in all kinds of trouble. Uh, it's really a case of, okay, great. You know what GDPR is all about now. How do I take some what are actually quite simple steps towards compliance? And that's really what my Facebook group is all about. Sensible, balanced approach that gives you those few simple steps that you need to take in order to comply. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And it's, it's great to hear you say that because that's the exact impression I got when I joined the group. I mean, I'd been looking around for a long time. I heard you speak um, somewhere else went and joined the group and it was such a breath of fresh air to get to find a community where there was, um, it was active for one. Um, <laughs> and there was, there was great advice and it was, it was practical and it was present. It's, pre, it's all presented in a way that's actually something that small business owners can understand and manage. It's not your complex. Legal that's what account. I see my, I see that as my job really. It's translating what is a com complex regulation from legislators in, in Europe who frankly haven't heard of a lead magnet before, you know, we're trying to take that uh, legislation and, and translate that into, okay, what is the reality for online business owners? Um, and, and yeah, we have to remember that the intention of this regulation is a very good one. If we think of ourselves as data subjects and how we would like organizations to respect our privacy and look after our data, it's coming from a very good place. It's just that the difficulty is in translating it from what the legislators were thinking about uh, to the practicalities of, you know, what opt-in box do we need for our lead magnet, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So look, let's, let's jump in. And for anybody who's watching who isn't sure exactly what GDPR is or what the intent of GDPR is or if it affects them, can you give us a bit of a rundown on, on sure. what the picture looks like? Sure. Well, in the EU, uh, certainly we've had uh, data protection laws for many years now, um, but our last law came into effect 20 years ago. And of course, data has really changed since then. The Economist stated recently that data is the world's most valuable asset. Uh, and the way that we're processing data has changed hugely over the last 20 years. So it's only right that the law catches up with what we're actually doing with data and how important it is. But ultimately, it's all about protecting personal data. So what's personal data? Well, it's anything that identifies or is capable of identifying a living individual. Okay, and that includes if you've got various different bits of information, if you put that all together, if you can identify someone, then you're dealing with personal data. And this applies. It talks about, we're talking about processing personal data. And some people have said to me, but I'm only storing those emails and name, names and addresses. So Surely this doesn't apply to me. It's an old list. It's just sitting there. I'm not doing anything with it. Well, no, because the definition of processing is really wide and it includes storing, um, it includes using, it includes making it available. So it's, it's a very wide definition of processing. But ultimately, there are uh, six principles, six data protection principles that we need to adhere to. Um, I'll run through those very briefly in a minute. Um, and then we need to have a lawful ground of processing. Now, the, the main thing to say about that is that people get really hung up on consent. Okay, everyone thinks GDPR equals consent. It doesn't. It's just one of the six grounds of lawful processing. And again, I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit. So that's what it's all about, making sure that data is secure, making sure you're being really upfront with people about what you're going to be using that data for, um, and just really giving the, the data subject, the person who's, you know, about who the data is, um, you know, that you know what data subject is, don't you? You know, it's the kind of, if you're giving your information to somebody else, you're the data subject. Yes. Um, so, um, so it's really about, you know, treating that data respectfully, being upfront with them and keeping that secure in a nutshell. Now, in terms of whether working out whether this all applies to you or not. Now, obviously, if you're established in the EU, it applies to you, full stop. And it applies to you in the totality of the data that you process. Okay, so if you are at the moment thinking, do I need to get my list to re-opt in? And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, then you need to get everyone to re-opt in, whether they are in the States, Australia, Canada, or wherever outside of the EU. Okay, so mm -hmm. you're in the, if you're in the, established in the EU, then it applies to everything. Yeah, 
Now, if you're established outside of the EU and um, you do certain things, which I'll talk about in a minute, then it only applies to your data subjects within the EU. So if you work out that you guys need to get fresh consent, then you only need to get it from the people within the EU, not people outside of the EU. Okay. okay. Now, this applies to um, businesses outside of the EU where your, the processing activities relate to offering goods or services irrespective of whether a payment is required. So it could be free goods and services um, to people within the EU or the monitoring of their behavior within the EU. Okay, so certainly if you're um, delivering Facebook ads to um, people within the EU, then that would be covered under the second limb of that. Um, now, in terms of offering goods and services, I think initially some people thought that if you had a website that was available around the world and you didn't geo-block people in the EU, that was sufficient to trigger this application of GDPR. Um, but actually, in the, uh, the guidance to it, it's really about the intent to offer goods and services. So they, they, they mention a number of things that would give a, um, a good indication that you were intending to offer goods and services to that jurisdiction. And that's things like, um, if you've got a page in French on your website, then, well, actually, maybe it's Canadians, but I mean, you know, if you've got a page in German on your website, then clearly you're intending to offer goods and services to people in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, if you have, if you're selling pounds, then clearly you're anticipating selling to people in Britain, etc. So there's things like that, which are really obvious indicators. Now, if you have, you know, if you've got, I don't know, maybe people have got 20% of people that are in the EU on their list, and they are regularly emailing that list with their goods and services, then they're going to, they're intending to offer goods and services to those people. Yeah. Now, this is a grey area. If you had one or two people who just slipped onto your list um, and, you know, I don't know how that might happen. But, you know, for one or two people, chances are, you know, even if the letter of the law said that you need to comply, chances are, I mean, I would take the commercial risk and say, I I'm just not bothering, you know. But if certainly if you've got, you know, say 10, 20 percent, something like that on your list, then then I'd be thinking, OK, I need to take this pretty seriously. Um, so that's the application of it. Um, so then um, just on to the, uh, the principles, which I'll run through really quickly. Mm -hmm. It's about lawfulness, fairness, transparency, um, really being upfront about what you're telling people you're going to be doing with their data. It's all about giving them genuine choice and control. So if you have your opt-in box, then at that point, you need to be saying, uh, OK, well, opt in for my free video and you're going to get this follow on sequence of even more amazing stuff. Um, you'll have a separate tick box for if you want to receive marketing communications. And you'll also have a link to your privacy policy, which is um, the document that's, that tells people in more detail what, what exactly you're doing with that data, where it comes from, uh, what type of data it is, what you're doing with that data, what's the purpose of the processing, if you're sending it to any recipients, which can be people like MailChimp or Infusionsoft or your payment processor or whoever it is. Um, It'll, it'll talk about things like if you're transferring data outside of the EEA, what safeguards are in place, which is an area that we should come on to because that's an area that often doesn't get talked about and it's quite key. Um, but really, if people keep in mind, it's just really informing the data subject what you're going to be doing with their data. Fair enough. If you think about it on the other side of the fence, that's what I want to know as a data subject. Exactly. We all, we, we all want to know where is it going? Like, what are you doing after we give you our name, email address and phone number or whatever it is? Yeah, definitely. Exactly. Exactly. So um, then the next thing is all about purpose limitation, which is really just collecting the data that is necessary um, for, sorry, data minimization, mm -hmm. Co collecting the data that is necessary um, for the purpose that you've told people that you're going to use it for. So that means if you've got a tick box and people are opting in, what that means is, um, you know, uh, well, you've got an opt-in form. Uh, you need their email address. You need their name so that you can send them that. What you don't need is their marital status, their inside leg measurement, what religion they are, you know, blah, blah. So you basically only collect the data that you need for the purposes that you've told them. Now, if you told them that actually we're going to be collecting this data and we're going to be selling it to this, um, survey company and, and they give you that data that's fine you can ask for their marital status and their inside like measurement and whatever else 
But the point is that you can only collect the data for the purpose that you've told them about. Yeah. Got it. That's really interesting because so particularly from a Facebook advertising perspective, right? So I think of the type of landing pages we often send people to and often, so let's say we have a lead magnet, right? Something that's free. We, you know, they give us their name and email and we give them a PDF or something in, in exchange. Now I can think of several enterprise level software companies um, that I use. And I know that when you opt in for their freebies, they will ask, you know, in exchange for this, business you know uh, email pdf checklist enter your name email and then it will have your company size it will have mm. um you know all yeah. different information about you and your business and the company and so it's really interesting to hear this because i'm hearing that well that might not be gdpr compliant necessarily yeah. what they, if they now what they should be that. Yeah, what they should be doing is they should be still sending the whatever they've signed up for and then having a separate uh, data entry, which is, you know, if you would like us to get in touch with you to talk about our products and services, please fill in the following so that we know, you know, who to who to call you or, or which brochure to send you or what, you know, etc. Mm -hmm. Or it might be that, you know, another example might be if you want to segment your audience so that you can send them relevant content. You could have that. You could absolutely say, you know, we'd love to tailor our content to send you relevant content. So it'd be great if you would let us know the following about your business. And then if people fill it in on that basis, that's fine. Yeah, you've just got to okay. be really upfront. Yeah. What's the purpose of collecting that data? And it's got to be necessary for the purpose. Yeah, that makes total sense. So it's not about, it's not about them restricting what we can collect. It's about us being upfront and very clear in this is what we're collecting and this is why, and this is how we'll use it. Right. It's, it's yeah. more about the communication between exactly. the exactly. collector and the, the data subject. Yeah, that's exactly it. So the, the next principle, and I've actually done them the wrong way around, but the next one is purpose limitation, which is really what we've just been talking about, which is um, you can't get, collect the data for one purpose and then say, oh, now I'm going to go and do this with that data. Okay, mm -hmm. so that, that is a principle in its own right. Um, accuracy, you've got to try and keep the data as accurate as possible. Um, and, you know, what, there isn't really guidance on what that looks like. But, you know, I think that certainly when you are, um, the, the ICO guidance is that you would need to go back to your list at least every two years to get fresh opt-ins for um, consent for marketing and things like that. So I think, you know, fairly regularly, maybe every six months, you might email people and say, here's the data we've got on you. Is this all still accurate? Or you let them have access to, uh, you know, there's some kind of way that they can get access to their own data to go and update it. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's a bit, again, it's a bit of a gray area. Some people just have it in their privacy policy. To say, you know, it's really important that we keep accurate. So let us know by emailing X if there's a change and that's probably sufficient but you know if if you wanted to um take it to the next level then i'm sure bigger businesses will do that mm -hmm. um storage limitation uh so you can only uh keep it for as long as is necessary for the purposes so again if we're thinking about dead lists that people might have really that should all be deleted you know that shouldn't be sitting there on people's um you know computers or servers or whatever if you're not using that data for anything then, and you've got no other purpose for storing it and delete it. And when, when we say that, we're talking about EU uh, data only, right? If we've got a, a list there with full of yeah. US-based uh, yeah. clients or whatever, we can. it's not really applying to that. It's applying yes. to the EU portion. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, but also do keep in mind that if you've got customers in the EU, um, then even if they are expired customers, you might need to keep that data for... Um, legal reasons, if there's ever any claim or anything like that, you'd need to keep some of that data, if not all, for legal reasons. So, you know, so in the UK, we have a limitation act of six years, which means that people have six years in which to bring a contractual claim. Uh, so, so people would be keeping that data, customer data, you typically would be keeping for six, six, six seven years to make sure that you've got that in case there was a contractual claim arising out of that, that customer relationship. Got it. Um, and then the final point is security. And actually, this is really key. And certainly what I found from my group, nothing's, nothing's really changed with GDPR from our existing legislation about keeping data secure. But obviously what the, the increased sanctions have done is really focus people's minds on uh, you know, what you need to do. And I'm amazed actually 
the, the, the level of um, just just the, the way that security of data doesn't really factor in a lot of small businesses and online businesses heads, you know, um, and I'll hold my hands up. I was nowhere near as hot on this as I should have been. So actually I've interviewed a couple of experts in my Facebook group on security. Um, and there's a couple of great videos in there if people need a bit of a refresher on that. But it's things like, you know, if you go to a coffee shop and you're working remotely and um, then that Wi-Fi is typically, you know, anyone can, anyone who knows what they're doing can hack in. Um, to your Wi-Fi and get get hold of all you know, export all of your data, send them phishing emails, get hold of their financial, you know, etc. And if you if we do discover a data breach now, and it's likely to impact on data subjects, then you have to notify that to a regulatory authority within seventy two hours of becoming aware of that breach. So um so you know the whole issue around security and data breaches is now a lot more uh, pressing. So we, we do need to look into the security side of it more and make sure that we have got that, those technical and organizational measures in place. You know, things like training staff, if you've got any, or just being sensible ourselves, not leaving, uh, you know, USB, unencrypted USB sticks uh, lying around and, um, you know, passwords in public places and things like, oh, leave, printing out sensitive data and leaving it on the train. You know, just, just common sense things like that we need to have a bit of a reminder about. Okay, so, any questions before I move on to the lawful grounds of processing? <laughs> no, I think that's a, that's a fantastic summary. Am um, I going into too much detail here for your guys, do you think? Are they going to welcome it? I think they're going to be loving it. I think they're going to be loving it. Um, they've been asking some really in-depth questions, so I think this is exactly what, what people are going to uh, be really interested okay. in. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the, the legal grounds of processing. If you're processing personal data, you need to have a lawful ground of processing it, or... You just can't process it. Well, you could, but you'd be breaking the law and there's chances of, you know, whatever happening. So, um, so as I say, consent is not the be all and end all. Consent is one of the six grounds. And consent obviously means where the individual has given you clear consent to process the data. Um, and I'll say a bit more about what the GDPR standard of consent is, because certainly in the EU, it's a higher level of the consent that we previously had to get. So I'll say a bit more about that in a bit. Um, contract. Um, so if the processing is necessary for a contract that you have with an individual or because they've asked you to take specific steps before entering into a contract, so for example, they've asked you for a quote or something like that, then you don't need another ground of processing. You don't need to go and get consent. So a lot of people have said to me, oh, what about the opt-in forms on my website? Do I need to have a tick box for people to submit a question to me? Uh, no, you don't need consent because you would be replying back to them based on this con contractual ground because they've made inquiries about your goods and services. And now, similarly for your... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, now I was going to say, now I would assume though, if you were to then take that email address after you answer their question, add it into your newsletter database and start blasting them with newsletters, that's a different story, right? It is, and I'll come on to that in a bit. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Um, so with, with, um, existing clients, if you're, you know, you'll be, and everybody who's got existing clients will be storing the client's email address, uh, name, maybe physical address, other details about them. You don't need to get consent to continue to store and use that data because you would have a contractual ground of using that data and anything that is necessary for the performance of the contract, that's your ground of processing. So you don't need to go and get separate consent for that. Um, the third ground is legal obligations where it's necessary for you to comply with the law. Uh, so an example of that might be, um, uh, you know, if you are legally required to keep certain records, for example, that are um, the personal data of other people, then you wouldn't need to go and get the consent for that. Um, you know, if you've got employees um, in the EU and you are obtaining their social security information, you don't need to get their consent for that because that's a legal requirement to pass that on to the tax man. Okay, so this, if you need to do something, if you need to process data by law, that's your lawful ground of processing. You don't need to go and get consent for that. Okay. And there's a couple of ones that aren't particularly relevant to this audience, which is vital interests and public tasks. But then the final one is legitimate interests, which is where the processing is necessary for your legitimate interests um, or the legitimate interests of a third party, unless there's a good reason to protect the individual's personal data, which overrides the legitimate interest. Now, we know that direct marketing is a legitimate interest because the recitals to GDPR tell us that. It's, it's a, an organization's legitimate interest to, to market, to grow its organization, to 
you know, tell people about what it can, how it can help them, etc. We know that's legitimate interest. That does not mean that you can just rely on this lawful ground and ignore consent because you have to carry out this balancing test with the legitimate interests of um, the data subject. So, of course, what that means is you can't spam them because that would totally be against the, the rights and freedoms of that individual. And um, so what um, GDPR says is that if um, people would reasonably expect to receive your communications, then that's an indication as to the fact that you would be able to rely on legitimate interests. So what you were asking before about customers, so either customers or people who are inquiring about your uh, goods and services, then arguably you would have legitimate interest to actually add them to your marketing list and to send them details about goods and services that are, are related to what they've been asking about. Obviously, if they're asking about hot tubs and you have a, a sideline in air balloons or you know whatever, you couldn't you know send them something completely unrelated. But um, but if you you know if you are sending them things that are very relevant to what they've they've clearly indicated that they're interested in, then you could um, rely on in, for GDPR purposes on legitimate interest. What you have to do the, the key thing about legitimate interest is making sure that you have carried out a legitimate interest assessment form. Um, I can tell you how you can get one, hold of one of those later. Um, but you, it's really about the documenting of your decision-making process and showing that you've considered the risks um, you know, of not getting the consent from the data subject and that, that what you're proposing to do with that data isn't um, prejudicing them, it's not overriding their own rights and freedoms, etc. So, but it's very much on us to consider all of that and, and have that on record so that if there is a complaint or a regulatory investigation, you can point to that. Now, there is this other law um, called PE, it's Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, PECR or PECA, some people call it. Um, and this at the moment only applies to um, businesses established in the EU, but it's being revised and it's likely to be revised next year to have the same territorial scope as GDPR. So, um, so at the moment, it just applies within the EU, but as of next year, it's likely to apply to people outside of the EU to the same extent that GDPR does. And what that says is that you can't send unsolicited email marketing to individuals. And individuals include um, sole traders, partnerships, I'm, I don't know what the expression might be in the States, but anything that's not a corporation, basically. Um, and there is a certain ground for being able to do so without consent, which is called the soft opt-in, uh, which is essentially sending marketing emails to customers or people who've inquired about your products and services um, if it's something similar. Uh, so there is this, it's kind of similar to the legitimate interest. You have to advise them of their right to opt out at the time that you collected the data and you have to advise them of their op right to opt out on each subsequent email, which most people do because we all have our little you know, opt out. things on the bottom kind of thing yeah. so um so for me when i'm thinking about do i need to get my list to reconsent there's two things going through my mind one is um have i got a gdpr standard of consent already and the second is can i rely on legitimate interests and the soft opt-in to not get consent from my customers um, and existing customers and possibly customers going back whatever period you think is acceptable for them to uh, for it to be reasonable for you to to contact them, you know, if if they're a customer that's five years old, they're probably not expecting you to get in touch with them. So that would probably not be okay. But if it was six months ago, twelve months ago, maybe. But it's for us to make that judgment in the context of our own business and decide, uh, you know, whether legitimate interest would apply. So if it, if we decide actually legitimate interest would apply to our customers and ex customers going back twelve months, we wouldn't need to get them to reconsent to, uh, you know, marketing emails being sent. Um, so that's it on the um, the legal grounds of processing. Now, just quickly on the consent rule before we get into specific questions on Facebook, because I know that's where you're dying to get to. Yes, yes. Um, but I'm guessing that I mean your your people are still going to need to know about. Um, whether they need to get people to re-opt into their list because presumably they all have you know marketing lists that they are sending marketing emails to yeah so this higher topic. okay cool so this higher higher standard of consent with gdpr so there's there's two two well three things to think about in the new definition of consent and the main one is that there has to be a clear affirmative act 
and um, giving that consent. Um, so what that means is no more opt-outs, no more pre-tick boxes. It means clean, clear, plain language that's really easy to understand. It means genuine choice and control. It means having your privacy policy really up front next to the opt-in box, so a link to your privacy policy. Um, it means giving them, notifying them that they've got the right to opt out at any time. Um, and it means giving them, where possible, um, separate granular options on what they actually want to opt into. So like what we were talking about before, you know, if you've got your typical opt-in box, you know, get my free report on you know, whatever it is, um, then you don't need, in my view, you don't need a tick box to send them the report because that's what they're entering their email address for. That's the affirmative action that's, you know, because what would you do if, if they enter their email address but don't tick the box saying I want the report, then you're like, oh, okay. They enter their email address, but then you know, what do I do? So you don't need the tick box to send the report because you've said, hey, you want the report, put the email address in. What you would need to have is the tick box underneath that says, um, if you'd like to receive details of my amazing offers and services, offers and discounts and promotions and whatever else, tick here. Got okay. It. Okay. Okay. So now, again, you know, this is a, um, that's what the law says. I'm sure not everyone's going to do that. Is anything really terrible going to happen to them? I don't know, actually. I think that as people get more savvy about it, you might start to see people saying, hang on a minute, you know, you've sent me this marketing email and I haven't opted in. You might get competitors trying to trip you up and, and causing problems for you. So I think that where we can do that, it's a good idea to do that. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. And okay, so if we can do that, then how granular do we need to be? So let's say I'm promoting something and it's, it's teaching people how to create better graphics for their Facebook ads, right? And so they, they click the button, they enter their email address. Um, you know, that's all fine. I've got a checkbox that says, you know, if, do you want to receive future marketing emails from me? Check here. They check the box. Now, if I then want to talk about, let's say, something that's related to Facebook ads, but not directly. So let's say I'm talking about, I later want to start teaching them about email marketing. Okay, it's, it's kind of related, but it's not. Would that require a second set of consent? Or like how, how specific does our checkbox need to be? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, there isn't a, a definitive list of, uh, of course, you know, yeah. the examples on that. So it's always a question of, of judgment, really. Okay. But you know, if, you, if you're as upfront as you, as you can be, and I think you know, something like that, I'd feel comfortable with that because it's all in the realms of marketing yeah. and, and people are likely to be interested in it. It's if you went off and opened like, a, you know, a caravan warehouse or something like that, you know, not everyone's going to be interested in that. So, you, you know, then you would have to you know, get, do a separate lead magnet and, and uh, you know, get, get different opt-ins from that demographic who are interested in that. It's so really, you know, it's, it's, yes, it's the law, but it's also just good, um, you know, good marketing practice, isn't it? Because you want to be sending people stuff they're actually interested in because otherwise they're not going to click in it. They're going to opt out. It's going to affect overall email de deliverability rates. So, you know, if you, if you were um, doing that, I think what you would do is, hey, you know, you send an email to your list and you'd be like, hey, guys, I'm branching out into email marketing. Click here if you want to know more about, about it. And then they'd go on a separate list that would send that to them. Yeah, the, yeah, and that makes perfect sense. And I think you're exactly right when you say you would. You'd see more spam complaints. You'd see more, you know, everything if you just started talking about a different topic. So, okay, that, that makes sense. That was something that a lot of people were asking me was where does legitimate interest start and stop? So it's good to sort of get a bit of a feel for that, definitely. Yeah, it's a, it is a real grey area. Basically, what we're doing is we're taking the responsibility of, of, of protecting the data, really, and, and, and taking away the, the data subject's right to do that, and we're doing it for them. So we have to be um, really, uh, you know, actually go through that de decision-making process and document it. Like I say, you can't just go, ah, yeah, legitimate interest will apply. You, know, you have to actually sit down and think, okay, well, is this, is this okay? I've done a lot of videos on legitimate interest in my Facebook group. So if that is an area of interest for people, then I'd go and have a watch of those. Perfect. Okay. That's great. All right, cool. So we, we've covered a little bit about the, um, about, about consent and that sort of thing. So I guess one of the things that, that kind of, and, and correct me if you want to go down a different path, but the next sort of thing that I'm thinking of here that might be worth discussing is 
where your responsibilities lie. So I know there are these there are these concepts of a processor and a controller, and depending on what your role is, um, that that determines what your responsibilities are. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about those a little bit as well? Sure. Yeah. So, like you say, the the uh, regulations do distinguish between a controller and a processor. Mm -hmm. Now, a controller is, as the name suggests, someone who controls that data. It's it's the person who determines the purposes and means of the processing of the personal data. Mm -hmm. um, and the processor is somebody who processes personal data on behalf of the controller under their instruction. So, an example: um, you've got a virtual assistant um, processing your. Um, I know she might, you, you might give her access to your Infusionsoft to send out some emails. Um, she's your processor. Okay, you're the controller of that, date, that, that uh, data. She's your processor. Or Infusionsoft is a processor in its own right, MailChimp, etc. cetera. Um, and um, so if people are doing Facebook ads, um, actually, you've not, you said you've not got, actually got agencies on here, have you? It's more they're doing it for their own businesses. Mostly it's, it's their own businesses. We do have some agencies, but the majority is... is okay, owners. but if you were an agent and you're processing data for the purposes of running someone else's Facebook ads, then for that data, you're a processor, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so for me, I often will get an email list export from a client and I'll upload that on their behalf to Facebook to create an audience. And in that case, yeah. I'm simply processing the data. I don't have control over that data. I'm just processing it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you're okay. a processor. And what GDPR does is, which is new, is that it, it imposes liability on processors. So certainly in the EU, under previous uh, data protection laws, there wasn't that same liability for processors. So processors are going to have to be a lot more careful about only acting on the documented instructions of the data controller. You can't just go on a whim and think, oh, I'll do this with this data, because you know, if there is a data breach, then you will be liable. Uh, so you have to be, um, the, the processor has to take a lot more steps now. Um, and the processor has to be GDPR compliant in their own rights. And in fact, it, the, the GDPR goes further than that and puts an obligation on controllers to only use processors who are, in effect, GDPR compliant. And certainly what we're seeing in my group at the moment is a bit of a panic around this in that people who are using particularly software providers who aren't yet compliant, they're thinking, oh my goodness, I've got to change my business um, to a new provider before the 25th of May because so-and-so isn't yet GDPR compliant. So I think that, you know, even if you're, um, if you're a data processor and you, you're thinking of ignoring GDPR because of the, you know, you, you just don't, you know, I, think, I, I think that people will see an impact on, certainly if you've got a good customer base in the EU, and you're not being GDPR compliant, then you will see as people become more aware, people will move away to other providers that are GDPR compliant. So I think that's a big reason for people outside of the EU to actually become GDPR compliant. Um, there's there's a, a number of uh, provisions about processes, but the two main ones that I'll just pick up here, and again, I've done a lot more videos on this in the group, um, but the first is that you um, that there has to be a, some contractual terms between the controller and the processor and they are specified in the GDPR. So what that might look like in reality is either you would have a new processor agreement or you would have um, processor clauses that go in the service agreement between the controller and the processor. But you have to have those specific, there's eight things that it says that have to be in those contractual terms. And the other main thing to mention is that if you use a sub-processor, then you have to, in effect, pass that chain of contract contractual protection down the line. Okay, because if you think about it logically, there's no point having all of these rules around what the data controller can do with the data and keeping it secure if they can just transfer it to a third party and there's no protection around that. And then that third party can transfer it to someone else and there's no protection around that. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of pass down this contractual protection through the different processes. So if you, for example, if you're using a software tool directly and it's it's your software tool not the clients then that is that that software tool is a is a sub processor and you would need to check out that that sub processor is gdpr compliant and that it has the uh, prescribed processor terms in its uh, terms of business okay okay you've okay. got to pass that chain on yeah that's really interesting and i mean even thinking 
even thinking about it at, at a simpler level and thinking, well, within my team, I've got team members who handle data as well. So I might, a client might send me an email list to upload and then I might say to my assistant, hey, can you take this and do X, Y, and Z? Yeah. And so now now if, if they're I, employees, if yeah. they're employees, that's fine. Okay. But if you're using freelancers, then freelancers are a separate legal entity and you would, in theory, need those processor terms with your freelancer. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Employees are fine because they're part of your organisation, but freelancers or contractors are a separate legal entity. So they would, I'd say, you would need those processor terms in place. Got it. And also, not just, not just the terms, but it is, it's, it's really important, actually, to start thinking about, okay, well, what security have they got in place? You know, because if there is a data breach and it's down the line from you, it's one of your freelancers, you're liable. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. 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 Which is scary because I think anybody who's dealt, who's worked in the freelancer market online will understand how difficult that can be to actually mm -hmm. find out and, and have any kind of influence over what controls they've got in place. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see how that impacts that sort of, that, yeah. that side of the market. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the other thing to think about with processors is that um, there is this concept of transferring data internationally, which means any data that's transferred outside of the EU, we have to think about more carefully because the EU thinks that it has the best level of data protection in the world and that there are lots of other countries where there isn't that same level of protection. So um, if you uh, um, are transferring it, there's kind of a, a tiered um, approach that you need to take to it. The first is, is the country that you're transferring the data to, um, does it have an adequacy decision? Um, that's where the EU government have basically said, okay, there's these 10 or 11 countries which we believe have sufficient data protection laws in place that you can freely transfer the data to. Now, that includes um, Canada insofar as you're transferring it to commercial organisations. It includes New Zealand. It doesn't include the States. It includes pretty random countries other than um, actually Switzerland is in there as well. Um, but pretty random countries like the Faroe Islands and Guernsey and places like this. Okay. Um, but then in terms of the US, what the US has is they have the Privacy Shield, um, which replaced the Safe Harbor. People might have heard of the Safe Harbor. That, that, was, uh, that, that, that was taken to court, basically, and, and found to be not sufficient. So we now have this Privacy Shield, which actually is now also being taken to court and is looking a little bit shaky. But at the moment, for um, US companies who want to... Um, have free flow of data from Europe, then they sign up to the Privacy Shield. This is kind of a self-certification method um, and it's, it's um, regulated by the FCA. Um, but there's only 4,000, I think I read 4,400 companies in the US that are signed up to the Privacy Shield, um, which you know, in, the, in the scale of the size of the US, in my view, is not very many. It's but if the, if, the, if the company is part of the Privacy Shield, then that's great, you can freely transfer the data. Subject to my point that there has to be this processor agreement in place if it's a controller processor relationship. Now, um, if you are not in the US and you're not part of the Privacy Shield, so you can be in the US and not part of the Privacy Shield, or you're anywhere else that doesn't have an adequacy finding, then the next thing is that you need to put in place what's called standard contractual clauses or model clauses. And these are um, contractual terms that the EU has approved in order to protect that flow of data outside of the EEA. Um, so that's the next thing to think about. If, if you haven't, you're not in an, if you're not in a country that's got an adequacy finding, if you are um, not um, part of the Privacy Shield, then you need to put in place these standard contractual clauses. And again, I'll tell you where you can get hold of those in a bit. Um, now, the, 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 the kind of tweak to this actually is that, well, it's not a tweak, it's, a, it's just a massive problem is that the, the standard contractual clauses haven't been reviewed to keep up with GDPR. So mm -hmm. at the moment, if you've got a US data controller who's got information from EU, having a US data processor or anywhere else in the outside of the EEA that isn't you know, part of the Privacy Shield or whatever, yep. or has an adequacy finding, then the contractual, standard contractual clauses don't, don't cover that situation because they only anticipate being an EU to so at the moment and I spoke to our regulatory authority about this at the moment you would then be looking to the derogations which is too complex for us to go into here but if, if people are, I've got videos on it in my group for people to go and watch 
Um, but essentially, um, the main derogation would be you need explicit consent from each data subject to the transfer of that data. So you if you say you had a US controller transferring it to a US processor that is not part of the privacy shield, then you would need, um, if there's no other derogation that applies, you would need the explicit consent of every data subject to that transfer. Right. So in the case of a 10,000 person email list, you need explicit consent from every single one of those 10,000 people in that specific scenario. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So it's complex, isn't it? You know, I mean, we're, we're getting into some complexity here, but it's more than just tick boxes on your opt-in forms, you know? So, um, so yeah, I, yeah. Don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want people to think on oh my, you know, they're probably shaking their head and me on oh my word. This is just so impractical and so unworkable. But I think, you know, and, and remember, you know, the 25th of May, I say, it's, it's not like, you know, this is it. If we're not compliant, that's game over. But I think this is all pointing towards, you know, I think we're going to see lots more um, US companies become registered under the privacy shield. Um, we're, we're, in time, we will see solutions from the EU as to, you know, they will probably amend the standard contractual clauses to cover this. There's also reference in GDPR to um, codes of conduct and, and other certificated routes. But we just don't have them at the moment. So what on earth do the regulators expect us to do, you know? Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know. But I think, yeah. you know, the risk of what I'm not suggesting is that um, people, you know, cause their business problems by suddenly having feeling that they have to switch from one processor to another. So say you're using Infusionsoft. Infusionsoft isn't part of the privacy shield. So if you're a US data controller and you're using Infusionsoft, then in theory, you should be getting explicit consent from each of your EU data subjects to the transfer of that data to Infusionsoft. Now, of course, what I am not advocating is that by the 25th of May, you think, you know, I've got to transfer, I've got to migrate my entire Infusionsoft to another platform like MailChimp that is GDPR compliant and part of the privacy shield. You know, I'm not saying that. Yeah. Okay. It's a commercial, it's a commercial risk analysis for every business. I'm just telling you what the law says, but, um, but you know, Going forwards, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot more focus on that. And as I say, I think the, the mechanics of doing that will just in time catch up with what the legislation says we actually need to do. Yes. Yeah. And I, I'm assuming that part of this will be the formation of precedent, of legal precedents as well. So until we see some prosecutions, until we see some, some legal precedents set, then we won't really have a clear picture. Yeah, I think um, it'll be interesting to see, certainly there's been questions asked about, well, how can, how can an EU regulator enforce this with a US company? And um, I think they absolutely can. We're seeing that with Facebook at the moment. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that you can't. Yeah. It's obviously on what scale is the, uh, the breach, if you like, what scale is the non-compliance? Is it going to be worth you know, overseas regulators coming and investigating you? So it's all a risk analysis. But as I say, I think we're, we're see, seeing this, this, um, uh, this paradigm shift in data protection. I think that US regulators are taking it a lot more seriously after the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica case. So you're going to see much stricter data protection laws coming through in the US. It might take some time because I know everything takes loads of time to get through their uh, their uh, Congress and and what, you know their other decision making powers. But um, but yeah, I mean, let, I think the message is let's try to comply where it is impractical because you know, the businesses are just not able, physically able to do it, then you take the risk analysis of what's, you know, what's the risk of this actually being an issue and you make your decision on that ground. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the important thing there that you, you kind of alluded to as well is like when you were talking about, yes, this is, this is complex, like it, it, there is a high level of complexity here. But I think the thing that businesses need to be aware of is that you need to understand the legislation enough so as so as you can assess it in in respect to your particular business because everybody seems to be looking for these blanket statements like you need a checkbox so you need to do this a b c d and you're done but everybody needs to look at the legislation in light of their own business and apply exactly. it in a very specific way that that works for them yeah. and not yeah. not just ah oh, I read a blog post that says you need a checkbox, you need a privacy policy and you need a new cookie policy and you're done. Right. Um, yeah, so I think exactly. that's, that's why it's important to chat about this yeah. complexity. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I've had, I have people posting in my group on regular, I've just done a video this morning actually, because over the last week or so, people have been sending emails from the larger companies that are asking people to 
um, opt out rather than opt in. And they're like, whoa, hang on a minute. You know, I'm, I'm thinking that I need to get these people to opt in and now I don't. I'm like, no, this is a different company. You don't know what they've done historically. They might have had a GDPR standard of consent. They might just, they, you know, it might be emails to existing customers. So they're relying on legitimate interests. You don't know. And it's wrong to make assumptions about other businesses and what they're doing. They might have, you know, just taken a commercial an analysis and thought, we've got 100 million quid in the bank. Even if we get hit with a fine, we're going to carry on. You know, yeah, we're not ready to lose those customers, you know, those potential customers. You just don't know. So, you know, you've got to understand the basics and then apply it in your own business. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so on that, look, let's, let's sort of move on. I know we could talk for, for hours about this. but I, I, know, I, I told you when you said half an hour, that would be optimistic. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. I know, right? <laughs> So let, well, let's let's talk about compliance. Like, how do as Facebook advertisers and and as like a small businesses running ads on Facebook? Uh, I think we, we focus there because that's the majority of the audience. Um, let's talk about a few ways, like the big things that we need to do in order to make sure that we're complying. So, um, I think we start. Let's start at the top and let's start start at Facebook ads themselves. Like. The, the first thing that we do when we start running Facebook ads is we put tracking on our websites so that we can see who's visiting and then we can use that data. Um, so let's jump in and talk about that. And, and I assume that, okay, if we're in, putting a tracking pixel on our website, let's, let's touch on what our role is in that case. Now, my understanding is that if we're putting that piece of code on our website that then collects data and sends it to Facebook, we are, Facebook is the controller in that situation, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so our responsibility there is as the processor? Yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's not, not, as quite straight, <laughs> not as quite as straightforward as that. I okay. think the things that we need to think about with, with pixels is more that um, you, you need to think about having your cookie policy in place that is yep. telling people that, that you're using cookies. Um, and there is, um, you know, it's not entirely clear what form the, if you decide that you need consent, which I'll talk about in a bit, mm -hmm. um, what form that consent would take, um, you know, because really the software isn't at a stage where you can implement it easily, where the consent comes first and then the cookies are blocked or people can opt in to certain types of cookies, but not others. Although that is, okay. that is coming, I think. Um, but the, 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 what, in, what I can absolutely say that you need to have is a cookie policy on your website that advises people about the cookies that are being used and their right to uh, switch them off, essentially. Um, so um, at the moment, uh, again, it's not entirely clear with, with GDPR coming into force because cookies can be personal data. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you had a cookie pop-up, then that would definitely be fine. If you, you, know, you see the cookie pop-ups that say, we're using cookies, is that okay? And everyone clicks on yes, you know, that's great. And you have a link through to the cookie policy, that's all good. Um, if, um, uh, even if you had a, a sort of a banner that isn't a pop-up, but just a, an obvious thing on your website, that might suffice. Um, but you've got to give people notice that you are, um, you know, using, using the cookies. Uh, now, I've read things that say that, because remember we've, we, we've got this, this, we need to take an affirmative act for consent to be um, a GDPR standard of consent. Um, so I've read articles that say that the, the mere act of continuing to browse the website is that affirmative act. Yeah, if, if your cookie notice is prominent enough and people continue to use the website, then that is the affirmative act. Mm -hmm. um, other things say, oh no, and these are typically the software companies that are selling the pop-ups, say, oh no, that's not sufficient. <laughs> what you need is our pop-up, okay? Yes. But, but, but what I do know is that you need a cookie policy um, on, your, on your website that is obvious. You know, you'd, you'd need it on each page and it needs to be fairly obvious. Um, so that I can definitely tell you. Now, um, PECR, um, also the, the regulation that I mentioned earlier, also does um, talk about consent for cookies. At the moment, that only applies within the EU. Um, but implied consent is okay for that. So if you just, as I say, if you've got that, uh, that cookie policy, you're okay for that. Um, the other thing is that in the privacy policy, you need to have a section that advises people about what you're doing with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so 
that's, I mean, again, I'll tell you how you can get a template privacy policy in a bit and that, that covers all of that. So that's the easy thing to do. Um, now, um, with PECR, what is changing is that, um, and actually I probably should have talked about this before, um, what is changing is that at the moment, PECR only talks about email marketing and text marketing. But we think that it's going to be extended next year to display advertising. So that would cover um, Facebook ads mm -hmm. um, and Google ads and things like that, which would mean that you would need to get a GDPR standard of consent, um, sorry, a PECR standard of consent for, um, for that. Um, and what that might mean is that you might need a tick box going forwards, but we're not worrying about that just yet. Okay. Got it. So, okay. um, so on the, uh, yeah, on the pixel, um, yeah, Facebook's a data controller. Um, really, I think, I mean, you're probably going to go to, on to ask me about custom audiences and things like that, but so I'll let you ask me about that. But the main thing is to remember using a Facebook pixel, have your cookie policy on each page in an obvious place Got it. for now until the ECR comes into force and then we probably need to do something more. But for now, that suffices. Okay, that's, that's really good to know because I've heard similar things to what you mentioned. I've heard people say that you shouldn't set any cookies or tracking until they click the OK button and then you, it's OK to do it. So, okay, that's really good. So we're, we're going to go with, for most cases, at least very prominent notification that cookies are in, in, in use and in play. Now, on that and as I've well... Done, in my group, there's a, there's a video on, on the whole cookie thing and Facebook pixels in my group where I go into it in a bit more detail, but that's... That's, you know, if you, if that's, that's the, the nuts and bolts of it. The nuts and bolts, yeah. And then, as you mentioned, for most people, they're going to need an updated privacy policy and cookie policy to be for GDPR as well, uh, is what I understand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yep. yeah, okay. And, and the reason for that is just more specificity, is that the yeah, nuts and bolts? Yeah, so in, in, um, in, the, the G, in the GDPR, it now sets out 13 things that you need to tell people in your privacy policy. Yes. So unless you had amazing foresight and you have a privacy policy that covers all those 13 points, then you're going to need to, uh, you know, you're going to need to update it. Uh, so, okay. um, you know, I, I've alluded to it, but I have a pack of template documents. Uh, I put it together in response to people in my group saying, okay, you're telling us we need all this stuff, but I don't want to go and pay a lawyer, you know, $2,000 or whatever it might be to draft these for me. Can you help us out? So I've put together a template pack that has lots of detailed notes and videos about what to actually do with these documents. Um, and uh, it's £197, which hopefully is affordable for most businesses. Um, and then obviously you've got all the supporting materials in the group. Uh, so I, I find that that's, that's really helped people, particularly you know, those who are panicking and thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to do all this? They get hold of my free checklist. They work out what applies to them. They watch a couple of overview videos that are in my Facebook group. Uh, watch the, I do daily videos. So they watch the daily videos that are relevant to them. And then they work through the pack. And often I find that, you know, they, they come in, in in quite panicked about how to get their head around it and how to comply without spending a fortune on traditional legal services. Um, and then they come in and, and clear half a day, work through the videos, get the pack, fill it in with all the notes that are there and they're kind of done. So, um, so they're loving, they're loving that, that solution. Yeah. Well, I, I bought the pack. Um, and I'm, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll just be up front, up front about that. And I, I, I found it invaluable. It's been so good. The templates are fantastic. The, the worksheets and things where you just fill in information and, right. and all that. Stuff. I'm pleased fantastic. to hear that. That's um, cool. Yeah. So in there's pretty, pretty much everything that I think that a business will need. It's obviously got the processor, t uh, processor agreement and terms that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, it's got lots of great checklists in there. If people have got employees, and there's a lot of employment documents in there. There's stuff to use going forwards. I mean, goodness, I hope that nobody has a data breach, but there's all the documents that you would need if there's a data breach and things like that. So really, it's every document that I can think of that will help people that is in there. So, Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and we'll set up a link for anyone watching. Um, so andrewhubbard.co forward slash GDPR is where we'll have it um, as well. So if you want to jump on that, that'll send you straight there to get it. But um yeah, it's, it's been a really good resource for my team. They've, they've really loved right. it. Um, all right, so we're, we've got a cookie so, policy in so place. Custom, 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 custom audiences, should we cover that? Yeah, let's, so just quickly yeah. touching before we go on to that, on our landing page, we're sending people there, we've got a cookie policy. It's, it's showing 
The other thing is that privacy policy now needs to be more prominent, correct? So it, instead yes. of having it in the footer, which is what most Facebook advertisers do, we need to have it right there next to the button that says submit, is my yes, understanding. Yes, exactly. Okay. A link, a link to the privacy policy. Yeah, so okay. a little word like, you know, we will protect your data in accordance with our privacy policy, link to the privacy policy. Now, what you don't need to do is lots of people get confused about this. You don't need to get people to consent to your privacy policy. It's advisory, okay, because in your privacy policy, you're going to be telling people that you're processing data for other reasons like contractual grounds, legal grounds, legitimate interests. You don't need consent to that, okay? You're just advising people. So... It's just, you know, we, we process your data in accordance with our privacy policy and then link to the privacy policy. Got it. Perfect. Okay. So, so that pretty much covers our, from what, I, from what I understand, that pretty much covers our landing pages and our opt-ins. Like we, we get there, we, we notify people very clearly what's happening with their data in, on the tracking side and we tell them about our privacy policy. We have our checkbox in place so we can send them subsequent follow-up marketing if we want to do that. Um, yeah. So yeah, let's talk about custom audiences now. We want to start retargeting. Now, there's a few different ways we use custom audiences. Um, so the first way we can talk about is, let's say we've got an email list and we want to run ads and target everybody on our list. So we export our list from Infusionsoft or Mailchimp or whatever, and then we take that list and we upload it to Facebook and we start showing them ads. So how does GDPR affect our the way we yeah. perform that on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. So I was speaking at a GDPR conference recently and this marketer stood up in a room full of people and said, GDPR spells the end of Facebook advertising. And this is what I mean about marketers who just make blanket <laughs> expressions like that without any kind of backing it up or anything like that. So I said, I uh, don't think it does. And we had this conversation. <laughs> etc. Um, but you know, in, in, in my privacy policy, my template privacy policy, um, we're relying on legitimate interests for doing that, okay? okay. Um, and what I was saying about PECR is that this is something we need to keep an eye on because as of when it's revised in 2019 and it has that extraterritorial scope, um, then um, if you need consent, then you need, you know, under legit, you can still rely on legitimate interests for GDPR, but you would need consent for PECR purposes. Um, and we're yet to really know what that looks like. So just kind of a note for people to think, oh, there's this thing coming up that might impact on this. I better kind of keep on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, certainly my privacy policy says legitimate interests for doing that. Um, and, um, and yes, you obviously need to cover that in your privacy policy. That's where you're advising people of doing that. And with legitimate interests, you need to tell people what the legitimate interests are, which again, there's, there's templates for this in my privacy policy. But you also need to give them the right to object to that processing. And, uh, and really, that is your opt-out. So what people need to be doing is making sure that when you are uploading custom audiences, obviously, it's not including the people who have opted out, right? But then that you are regularly updating that list within Facebook of people who are opting out going forward. So you've always got a fairly up-to-date list of people that you are uh, targeting which makes sense. You don't want to be spending your marketing pounds on people who've opted out and said, I'm not interested in your stuff. So we just need to make sure that we're doing that more regularly. Now, we talked about this before we, we started this um, recording, but Facebook's own uh, custom audience terms say, you represent and warrant that you have provided appropriate notice to, so that's what we say about the privacy policy. You know, you are, you're providing appropriate notice to them in, their, in your privacy policy and you've secured any necessary consent from the data subjects whose data will be used to upload, blah, blah, blah. So the key word there is necessary, okay? You've got any necessary consent. So going forwards, if um, legally under PECR, you have to get consent for showing display ads um, mm -hmm. and Facebook ads, then under Facebook's own terms, not only would you obviously need to comply with the law, but you need to for Facebook's terms. And we, um, we were talking about, there's been some uh, discussion in, in um, uh, people like TechCrunch and, and other online forums like of, uh, magazines like that that are saying, uh, let me just find the article actually. It says uh, that um, they're going to be launching, Facebook's going to be launching a certification tool that will check and ensure 
sure that marketing is rightfully obtained with user consent. Um, now, what I imagine that this will be, because you know, if you think about it logically, Facebook aren't going to um, impose any obligation on people okay, that would be against their commercial interests, but they're keen to ensure that people are complying with the law. Um, so what I imagine that certification tool will be will really just be reflecting what their current terms say, which is where you legally need consent, you've got that consent. Um, but they might put in a tick box nearer to the place where you upload it so that it's not sort of hidden away in the terms. I don't know if they do that. Do they do that already? I can't remember. There's no um, checkbox. So anyway, there is... <laughs> There's no checkbooks. Okay. So I suspect that's what it might be. There'll probably be a little statement when you upload your custom audience that says, if you legally need to get consent, then you've got consent. I imagine. I can't think what more they could do in that sense. But Facebook are clearly aware of this issue. So we need to keep an eye on their own terms and what they're uh, telling us that they need. But as, you know, I, I really don't think they're going to go any further than what the law requires. So, um, okay. so yeah, so the key message there is really, um, in my view, at the moment, we don't need to get consent for Facebook, for Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. um, you rely on legitimate interests under GDPR. And if PECR applies to you, then um, uh, it, it, it's not relevant anyway because it doesn't, it doesn't currently apply to um, Facebook ads. It's just email marketing and text. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just need to make sure that you are regularly updating that custom audience to make sure that any opt-outs are being reflected basically. So you need to, you know, maybe every week or something like that, you would upload a new custom audience to make sure that people who've opted out aren't getting marketed to. Okay, uh, yeah, got it. And that's really interesting because I know a lot of marketers who one of their strategies is to actually purposefully upload lists of people who've opted out with the aim of showing them, let's say a different lead magnet or a different whatever it is yeah. to bring them back into the list, right? Um, so yeah, if, if for those situations, that's a definite clear, you can no longer yeah. do that, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. okay, perfect. So what about the situation? Now, now you can, of course, just target them through interests and things like that. That's yeah. absolutely fine. Yeah. But what you can't do is, is use their data anymore because they've told you you can't use it for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and in theory, you should probably be deleting that data as well is yeah, that if, if, you, if you don't have any other lawful ground of processing it then yes you should be deleting it mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. okay so what about the scenario where we're not taking an email list but instead we're just relying on the pixel it's pixeling visitors to our website or even let's go one step further removed and say that people are watching our videos on facebook on our facebook page and then we're retargeting them with ads now in that scenario, there's no real way to get any form of consent. So, and that's that's fine because you've not uploaded anything there, have you? Yes, so you're not the yeah. data controller. So that's Facebook, and and Facebook have got that consent through their own terms, um, user terms. Yeah. yeah. So now, if you go onto Facebook's privacy settings, it tells you that you can opt out of um, targeted ads. It says you're still going to receive ads because they're a free platform and frankly, they can do what they want on it. Yep. But they can't, what they can't do is use data, your data to target ads if you don't want them to. So I went on and I was like, hooray, I can opt out of all of these ads. But actually, they very cleverly explain that if you opt out, you're still going to see the same amount of ads. They're just going to be untargeted. And, and personally, I'd rather see targeted ads than non-targeted ads. So, um, but, so we don't need to worry about that. That's Facebook is the controller. Facebook has sought the relevant consents, et cetera. So it's only really where we're uploading our data to Facebook that we need to be concerned about it. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to clarify that for anybody who was watching and kind of getting worried that, you know, we're talking about this consent and, and all that kind of stuff uh, to show ads. And yeah, so it's, it's good just to clarify that nothing to worry about on that side. And that kind of leads me into lookalike audiences, which is essentially, I'm assuming, very similar in that. Yeah, exactly. Facebook's it's Facebook's data. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so we don't need to worry about anything on that side of things. All right. So is there anything else in regards to Facebook ads specifically that you think we should be looking out for or that we should be addressing as a, as a, you know, as a priority. Yeah, they're, they're, they're the main points. They're yeah. the main points. Okay. Um, 
I think that the key thing coming up is is PECR because and, and the revision in 2019 because that will have territorial scope outside of the EU um, and it will apply to Facebook advertising so I think that's when we will see a big change in Facebook advertising. Perfect and the one thing I did just want to quickly revisit and I understand we're running short on time so that was the existing list and the consent. So just to, to reiterate that, if we've got an existing list and they've opted in under the grounds or you're, you're uh, putting it under the grounds of legitimate interest, so let's say they've opted in and I've been talking to them about Facebook ads via my newsletter for the last 12 months, um, I, as long as I believe there's a continued legitimate interest in emailing them, I don't need to go back out and say... Is this existing customers? Existing existing leads or customers, yeah. So do I need to go back out now and get separate consent? And I know this I know it's it's not black and white, but Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think for for customers, certainly I'd be confident in arguing legitimate interests. For yep. prospects, it would depend what you have what you have how you've obtained their consent in the first place and what you've told them. So that's where you need to look at whether you've got your GDPR standard of consent for them. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And that's, and that's the crucial part here is GDPR standard of consent. So does your yeah. consent meet that standard? Yeah. And there is a checklist, if you haven't discovered it yet in my pack, because you said you bought it Same in my it. pack, there is a checklist of what is GDPR standard of consent. And I've done yeah. lots of videos of, of it on that as well in my group. Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much. I'm, I've got no doubt that my audience are abs- you know, going to go... You see, you've actually enjoyed this interview. I bet you didn't think you would actually ever enjoy an interview about GDPR, <laughs> but I reckon you've quite enjoyed this. No, I, I seriously have. I seriously have. And there's, there's, another, <laughs> there's another 50 different things I could ask you, but, uh, you know, I know we have to wrap it up out of respect for time, but I have. And it's something that, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's something that, you know, we've all got to deal with. And, yeah. You know, yeah, if we can, if we can sort of do it in a way that benefits our businesses as well, then uh, why not get in there and do yeah. that? So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like, like I said, thank you so much again for your time. Uh, I'm sure the audience is, you know, my my audience is going to absolutely love this. If they want to find, or if if you guys who are watching want to find out more about Suzanne, make sure you join her group. So the group is, let me look at my notes: GDPR for Online Entrepreneurs, uh, US, uh, UK, US, CA, AU. Um, or you can just go to my my short link, andrewhubbard.co forward slash GDPR group. And if you want to get that pack that Suzanne mentioned, which, like I said, I, I've got it, I use it, my team are going through it now, I'm working through everything. It's a steal, I think, at £197 because it's just saved us so much time. Um, you can grab that as well, andrewhubbard.co forward slash GDPR. Uh, I think it's actually less for people outside of the, because that includes VAT, so if you're outside of the EU, um, it's like 150 or something like that because that's an inclusive of that price. So it's actually even even less than that. <laughs> that explains it because I went through and bought it and then I got through to the actual payment and it was like 150 pounds or something. And I was thinking, yeah. I don't know why that is, but I'll take it. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. uh, fantastic. Yeah. So thanks again, Suzanne. Really appreciate you taking the time today and uh, I'm sure this is going to help everybody watching yeah. uh, feel a bit more comfortable and, and uh, feel a bit more confident that we'll be able to get up to scratch with GDPR. Great stuff. All right. Thank you and talk to you soon. Bye.